that. Um, Robin, can you bring up those two copies of Map Point that are sitting there at your feet? Or, yeah. That one right there? So, uh, so I guess we'll do one of the copies of Map Point first. Be really bad form if you drew your own name. Uh, this is, oh, how about we read the number from the beginning? I'll just read the last four digits, 4089. So it's not on that side of the room. It must be over here somewhere. You want to come up? 4089. It is a copy of uh, Microsoft Map Point. The which version are we up to? 2006. The actual ticket. No, I put the ticket in the box. I don't know if you that okay, yeah. yeah, all right. All right, next. So the other copy of Microsoft Map Point. You did so well, I'm going to not use you again. This one is uh, 4009. 4009. Aha. Congratulations. And now the biggie. Since I've already told Barbara that she can't win again, you got to pick just one. This is the ICOM IC2200, which is buried. Uh, ICOM very nice donated this for us. So everybody can see Ray say thank you. <laughs> I can't believe this. 4008. So who came in? 4008? Could it possibly be mine? I don't think it's even close. No, I was actually 4004, so it's not mine. So it's got to be one of the staff. Miguel, Art, 4008, 4008. He's looking for a black pen now. <laughs> no? It is Miguel. Is it really Miguel? Look at that, 4008. Congratulations. Exactly, free lunch and a radio. So, so um, hopefully everybody got enough food and uh, we're gonna move on into the, the afternoon track. This is where we take our nap time, ha ha. So, uh, Next is Lyle, uh, KK7P, and I always have trouble with your call, and I don't know why. But uh, I actually just read your bio again and realized you helped start Tapper. Oh, yeah. I had no idea about that. So very, very cool. We, I actually met him when he came down to do a talk at our club. Um, he knows a little bit about AO51, um, having built half of it and helped launch it. So among other things, he's a... Uh, very, very good at this kind of digital stuff. So with that, I will turn it over to him. Never trust it if it doesn't have wires. Thanks very much, Kenny, and thank you all for the opportunity to speak here again. Um, I think last year that the staff must have been recovering from lunch or something, so they let me come back. Um, today, uh, I want to talk about digital modes and uh, starting out specifically with uh, or focusing primarily on PSK31. And given the venue, I thought it was appropriate to talk about doing this without a PC. Um, let, let's see what the first slide says if it'll get me out of trouble. Now, sometimes I get a little bit long winded and, and, and people want to get me to sit down, so I should probably ask if you have any questions. 
Okay. Well, I want to thank you very Oh, no, I'm sorry. I'm getting ahead of myself. Wrong slide. Okay, here we go. I want to talk a little bit about PSK31 basics to begin with. Now, this is not going to be, here's how you run DigiPan, here's how you configure the Windows mixer, here's how you pound your fists through the keyboard. But I want to talk about it a bit from the technical standpoint. Uh, PSK31, uh, first of all, it's a narrow band mode. It has an occupied bandwidth nominally of about 63 hertz. It's designed for real-time QSOs, uh, and I don't mean that in terms of like real-time operating system stuff, but I mean it's intended for keyboard-to-keyboard -keyboard communications, ham-to-ham. -ham. Uh, so it has no error correction. Uh, there's no binary modes. It's not designed for file transfer. Uh, being that it is narrow band and it is phase shift keying, it's pretty good for, for weak signal work. Um, and, and of course, nowadays typing speeds tends to mean push F2 push F3, push F4, and then call CQ, go back and push F1 again. But, uh, but you can actually type letters as well. Okay, one of the things about PSK31 is that it requires a linear transmitter. Uh, it's not a constant envelope mode like CW. I'm CW when the key's closed, obviously, or RTTY. So you typically have to use a sideband transmitter. Uh, you might ask yourself, well, why is that? And, and, and we'll get into that. Someday I'll figure out left and right. Um, so to generate a PSK signal, the first thing obviously is you've got to accept the data from the user. Then whatever form that your computer happens to use to represent data, which might be ASCII or Unicode or EBCDIC or something, uh, you need to encode this to VeriCode. Uh, VeriCode is, uh, is an alphabet that was mentioned uh, in the first talk this morning. Uh, it's a variable length sort of alphabet, means of representing the data so that the, the more popular letters, the ones that keep winning the contests like E and T are short and the longer ones like commas and question marks take a little longer. So in principle, this is quite similar to Morse code. And then of course you have to modulate it onto the RF carrier. And it's phase shift keying, so we're shifting the phase of the carrier, not its frequency, not its amplitude. So we shift the phase for information. But we also wind up changing the amplitude because we want to limit the bandwidth at the phase transition. So you might ask yourself and say, well, doggone it, if all we're shifting is the phase, I mean, FM is just shifting frequency, frequency and phase are so related, why can't we just do phase shift and not mess with this amplitude stuff and then we can use a class C amplifier and then I can uh, take my ATS-3B and I can run PSK with it. Uh, and, and the answer to that is in this slide. Okay. For PSK31, 30, see if I use this pointer, then you guys can't, you guys lose, and if I point it over there, then I can't hold it steady enough so you can see how old I am. So just look at the picture. Okay. Um, so the, uh, the carrier phase is reversed in PSK31 when we're sending a zero. We hold the phase steady when we're sending a one. But if you reverse the phase of a carrier, it occupies a lot of bandwidth. Uh, this particular illustration is from an article by James Miller called The Shape of Bits to Come, uh, and it's on the AMSAT website, and if you've never read James's paper, this is, uh, well, you should. I'll, I'll, let me just leave it at that. You really should. Anyway, if you look at this, you'll see that the main lobe there uh, as FC is reaching the top of the chart, but the first side lobe is only down 13 dB. You might look at this as being splatter. The next side lobe is down about 18 dB. The third side lobe is down 20. By the time you get down to minus 30 dB or so, your little 63 hertz wide signal is occupying on the order of a kilohertz. And it's, you can think of it as key clicks if you want. It's just not good neighbor policy. So the guy that developed PSK31 realized this. Let's see if I get left and right correct this time. Oh, got it. OK. So, we, he realized the answer to the following question. How much splatter do you generate if your transmitter is turned off? And the answer is not enough to annoy your neighbor. So with PSK31, what we do, and for you on this side of the room, I'm going to ask you if you just kind of defocus and cross your eyes. You can look at that picture, but you can follow this dot, this dot. Uh, this envelope is, is a PSK31 transmission. This to the right, to your right, 
is sending a one, and over here we're sending a couple of zeros. We sent a zero and another zero, and you can see that the amplitude goes down to zero at the time that we're doing the phase reversal. It's really hard for you to see the phase reversal from where you're sitting. I tried to make that picture smaller, but I couldn't, so that's as difficult as I can make it for you. But it, it turns out that there actually is a reversal of phase when it's at zero amplitude. Well, th but if you look at the chart below, you'll see, well, gosh, but I still see side lobes. Now, this time they're down about 31 or 32 dB, but they're still side lobes. If you're changing the phase when you're not transmitting, how can there be side lobes? How are you occupying bandwidth? Well, the answer to that is, while CW is a carrier, you have to key the thing on and off. If you don't properly shape the keying, you occupy a lot of bandwidth. So that shape that you're seeing of that envelope is to minimize the effects of the amplitude modulation of the carrier. But you'll have to admit that having your, your side lobe being 31 dB down from the AM component is a lot better than having it only 12 dB down from the phase shift component. So the bandwidth that's being occupied by this signal isn't because of the phase shifting that's going on, it's because of the AM that's going on. But if you didn't use the AM, you'd use a lot more bandwidth. This also tells you why if you've got a KK7UQ uh, IMD meter and you happen to be looking at your PSK31 thing, that you just can't get it down below about 31 or 32 dB. Well, that's why. Um, it's, it's the math that's behind it. So the bottom line is that we change the carrier phase at, at the instant of zero amplitude, and it requires a linear transmitter. And this particular set of illustrations is from uh, Mo Wheatley. Let's see if I can write again. Ha, got it. Okay, so here again, is the bottom of this illustration is sending a zero. You bring the amplitude down to nothing, reverse the phase, and bring it back up again. If you're sending a one, you just leave well enough alone. The block diagram at the top gives you a little bit of an idea about how we do PSK modulation. And no, there won't be a test at the end of this. It's okay. This is for you to help get a little bit of sleep time unless you had Mountain Dew. So you, you have the, uh, I had Mountain Dew, so I'm stuck up here. Uh, you take, uh, obviously, user input. You, uh, you buffer it. You look it up. You serialize it. And you do stuff. And eventually, it comes out through a DAC as audio out to the rig. The other implication that you need sideband. Okay, and as with most things, modulation is much easier than demodulation. Um, for th I remember when I was younger and thought I could send CW, that I was convinced I could send CW faster than I could receive it. And I won't go any further than that. Okay, PSK demodulation, the other half of the process. Uh, obviously, if the information is based on phase, you need to lock onto the phase of the signal. You need to then figure out where the bits are in all of that stuff, and recover the clock so that you can recover the data so that you can send that clocked data off to the very code decoder so that it can do the magic that it's got to do and bring it up on the screen of your uh, computer. The other thing you need to do is lock onto the frequency of the signal that's coming in, not just the phase, because you want to typically operate this, unless you're a Ducey Island or something, you want to operate zero beat. You want to be transmitting on the same frequency that you're receiving on. If you've got a narrow band mode, you might as well both occupy the same small space instead of occupying more. Here's a block diagram of the demodulation process. Now, unlike the modulator, there will be a test on this. No, seriously, the, the, the whole point here is not to go through this block you know, bit by bit, but just to show you that the demodulation process really is a lot more complex than the modulation process. Um, and this happens to, again, be a, a block diagram of what's going on in, uh, in uh, Mo Wheatley's uh, decoder. And the importance of that will be made apparent in a little while. OK, so much for that. What a early PSK work, now that we know a little bit about the signal, the theory, and why it's done the way it's done. How was it done in the early days? When was it done? Well, it, it, this stuff was all developed kind of in the 1990-ish time frame and, and, and afterwards. Now, I, I know that most of you are, are too young to remember this, but in 1990, um, we had computers. Uh, and most of them didn't run Windows. In 1990, that would have been Windows 2.0 or 1 point something. Um, most uh, shack computers that people had in those days were either an Apple II running a little O2 uh, with a plug-in Z80 card running Microsoft Basic, or uh, they were uh, 
PCs running DOS. So if you wanted to do work with digital modes in those days, uh, you had to be hardware oriented. And one of the uh, devices that Tapper got heavily involved with around that time frame was with a, a, a Motorola evaluation board. And we've made a little interface box for it. And this has a Motorola 56000 in it and a, and a radio interface so you can connect it to your radio. And the idea was that you develop the software on your PC, then you would cross your fingers, and then you would download it into this thing, and then you'd try and figure out what happened. Um, so as a result, there weren't a lot of people doing it, but there were some. And there was a fellow, Pavel, in Poland, SP9VRC, and he developed a mode that he called Slow PSK. And he was just trying to fiddle around with narrow band digital signals, uh, and he was having some fun with it. Well, a, a guy named Peter Martinez, G3PLX, the guy that brought us Amtor back in the 70s, uh, he was looking to go a bit beyond that, and he saw what, what uh, Pavel had done, and he thought, you know, this is cool, and maybe we could do something even better than Amtor here. So he started uh, looking at the slow PSK mode, and that's when he came up with his Vericode alphabet, ways to improve the, the throughput of a slow data mode like that. And, uh, and so he developed uh, the first uh, PSK31 stuff on this Motorola evaluation board. And it was also done on a little TI 16-bit board, as mentioned in the slide there. And then you'd use the computer basically as an ASCII terminal to talk to this little uh, DSP board. And, and that's how it was done. Sound cards were an accessory that you could get. And, and you didn't have drivers for it. It was, it was a very, very different world. Gosh, I hate to think that was 18 years ago. So I won't. Well, when did PSK31 become popular? It became popular when PCs started to run things like Windows 95, Windows 98, and there started to be this explosion of sound card software because sound cards became cheap and then they became built into the motherboard. Uh, and nowadays, I'm not sure that you can get a computer that doesn't have a sound card function built into it, at least, at least not a new one. Maybe you can get one out of the dumpster, but I'm not sure. I think most of those have sound cards in them too. So nowadays, to run PSK31, typically you need a relatively modern computer. And, um, and by that, I mean one that's probably less than 15 years old. Uh, and, and that's basically it, uh, along with a radio and stuff. And, and we'll get into that. In fact, let's get, get into it now. This, this is a picture that I took yesterday in my shack of what I'll call traditional PSK31 operation. It's using a, a radio. In this case, it's on 20 meters and 14070 because that's the frequency that uh, people tend to hang out at the PSK31 watering hole. And then you've got a computer with a with a program that uh, 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 operates with the sound card and provides the interface for you to type and to see what's going on. And then you need some sort of a radio interface device that happens to be that SignalLink USB that was talked about earlier today, which is what this is here. OK, enough explaining the picture. Let's get on to it. That looks like pretty much what I just said. You've got to have a sideband transceiver, a computer with a sound card. So this is not your father's 386SX running DOS 3. And you need some sort of a computer radio interface. And the important point there is you need to isolate the audio. Uh, so if you don't have a, a, an interface that has a sound card built in, you want to have some sort of isolation of the audio, or else you'll get ground loops. And because people tend to, when they operate digital modes, they tend to not listen. They tend to turn the volume way down because it's annoying. So they don't realize that the signal that's being transmitted is really terrible because of all this ground loop noise. So you really want to isolate that audio. And it may include a sound card function. And that was covered earlier this morning. Well, thinking about this, as was mentioned earlier, some of my background was from packet radio back in the dark ages. Lately, I've been involved a bit with, with QRP stuff, with portable operation. So this traditional station is, is, is it's great for home stations, uh, where, you, where you've got plenty of power, unless it's just rained, um, where you've got the physical space to set up a, uh, a radio station, and, and the lighting is appropriate for a computer screen. But it's difficult for portable operation. Uh, a laptop screen is not often very visible in direct sunlight. You'll have to take that by faith that I'm telling you the truth, because I know you live in the Northwest, and you've never seen direct sunlight. But, but it's true that if you get a laptop computer in direct sunlight, that unless it's uh, uh, laptops for children's XO, uh, you're not going to be able to see it in that direct sunlight. 
Plus, there's lots of cables and stuff. You probably saw it was three of us getting this set up, and it only took us about 20 minutes to get this set up. Uh, if you're going out there on a picnic and it's actually stopped raining, within 20 minutes it's going to be raining again. So it, it's just not going to work. And of course, then there's power. I, I, <laughs> I don't know why I probably shouldn't even mention it, but when we were doing some of the early packet radio stuff, uh, we wound up trying to set up stuff in a tent on a beach in San Diego. And we needed power, and so we wound up pitching one of our tents near a pole and ran a long extension cord, literally, over to this pole where we could plug in and get some power. Anyway, there'd be no room for lunch on the picnic table. You can see there's no room even for brownies up on this table. Okay, I want to try and switch the screen here. Um, well, the screen's gone. Oh, okay, I got the screen, and if I do this button, and if I do that, then you can see a uh, you, you can see Mr. Digipan up there, and let me just clear this because, after all, one is supposed to clear that. Okay, um, if another station if station started getting on the air and transmitting, and I'll try and pretend to be another station, get on the air and transmit if I can. Uh, helps if I plug in the keyboard. So I can uh, let me do something else. So you can see it being decoded down here. The quick brown fox jumped over the lazy dog's back and so forth. So we're sending PSK from another station. We receive it on this station. Uh, you can see really terrible IMD patterns down here where, where things are just repeating and repeating and repeating. Uh, that wide bandwidth is brought to you courtesy of the FT817. Um, we won't go there. Um, and uh, if you wanted to send, you could type or you could do something as obnoxious as just having a pre-programmed function key thing here where it gets on the air and sends. Not terribly interesting, so we'll, we'll let it end. Anyway, this is, this is what, a tra what a traditional PSK31 station would typically be. Computer, sound card, interface, radio, lots of space, lots of power. Well, if you're interested in portable operation at all, there's got to be a better way. It worked. OK, so let's move on to the better way. Well, one better way is to replace the, the PC and sound card interface box function with something that replaces the PC and the sound card interface function. Uh, and what I'm going to talk about now is something that was featured in the uh, March-April issue of QEX. It's also in the March issue of QST. Um, I'm sure that's hard to see. Is that better? Um, OK, there we go. Um, and anyway. There's a, a group called the American QRP Club. Uh, it's a pretty small group, but these guys like to do interesting and innovative things. And one thing that they've developed over the last year is this thing called the NUE PSK31 modem. Um, and we've got a picture of it there. I've got one set up here that we're going to demonstrate in a couple of minutes. And Doug's got one in pieces over here. Will the batteries fall out if I hold that up? OK, I'll the batteries. This is, this is uh, kind of like laptops for every child, but dedicated function and smaller, but not less expensive. So we, we, managed, we managed to keep one constant there. OK, let's, uh, let's and, and you, can, you can see that you know this thing has a place to radio and power, and it's got a display. And we'll just get into this a little bit. As I mentioned, the March issue of QST, the March issue of QEX, explained to this thing in, uh, in, in pretty good detail. The, the, the main claim to fame here is for portable operation. It's, uh, it's low power. Uh, again, it's a sunlight readable display. Um, I don't know if it's a waterproof display, but it is sunlight readable. Uh, and it's a relatively low cost device. You can, you can get them now. Uh, they just started taking orders for these things in December and started shipping them uh, in March. 
Yeah, March. Um, and uh, they're 200 bucks ready to work, or 150 bucks if you want to solder it up yourself. Um, and the, uh, the hardware design is published on the web. The software is all open source. You can just duplicate the thing yourself. They're not in this uh, to make any money. They're just uh, doing it primarily to provide a service. Uh, and again, George Heron, N2APB, and uh, Milt Cram, W8NUE, which is obviously where the NUE part of the PSK modem comes from. So uh, again, goals here were to eliminate the PC for, port for portable operation, to have a straightforward user interface. Um, and the thing runs on internal batteries. You saw when I held that thing up. Those of you in this row saw when I held that up. Those of you back there were wondering what I was holding up. Um, Anyway, it has a couple little 9-volt batteries inside, so you can take it out, get your station set up, get it all turned on, and just as you're starting to, uh, to work that rare DX, you can have the battery go flat. Um, it draws about 60 milliamps, I think, when the batteries are fresh, and it has a switching power supply, so as the batteries get weaker, it pulls harder. Um, the, other, the other advantage of the switching power supply is because PSK31 is pretty good as a weak signal mode. In order to really appreciate weak signal, you've got to have a, a, a degraded signal to noise ratio. And the switching power supply is a great asset for if your antenna is right next to the modem. Um, this, uh, this was made possible because they're using relatively new technology in this. And you've probably all heard of microchip and PICs. The PICs have been around forever. The talk this morning mentioned that the, the US Interface Navigator's got a couple of PICs inside of it. Um, uh, microchip added a DSP function, or a set of DSP functions, to their microcontroller line, and they call this thing the DS pick. And then finally, uh, the tools used to develop software on it are cheap. Hams like things to be cheap. We've learned this over the years. And in this case, we're hoping that free counts within the paradigm of cheap. Okay, some of the illustrations earlier about what goes on inside of a PSK modulator and demodulator were from code that was written by Mo Wheatley. Uh, Mo Wheatley is, has made this uh, open source and, and absolutely public. Anybody can use it. He's made a little DLL so that uh, those of you that are uh, using Windows things and want to embed PSK31 somehow into your application, you just link in the DLL and off you go. It's very, very well documented. So when Milt was... Uh, uh, getting together with George to write the software for this thing, he just decided, well, shucks, I'll just grab this PSK core that's already been written. It was written to run on a PC and run in Windows, but it's written in primarily C. Maybe there's some C++ in there, I'm not sure. But Milt was able to use the, the C compiler that Microchip makes available for free for their DSP. Of course, he needed some DSP functions, so uh, things like, uh, you know, do filter and get signal and, and so forth. So uh, he got that from the microchip library. He, he happens to be fortunate enough to live in Austin, Texas. At least some people that are there think it's fortunate. Um, and uh, there was there have been several projects going on in that Austin QRP club. So he just used some modules there. Uh, so basically, just had to write a graphics driver for the graphics display that was used in this thing, and then stitch it all together and make it work. I say he just had to. That's obviously a lot of work. Now, I mentioned how simple the hardware is. There's a complete schematic diagram of the whole thing. Um, and it's not like you've got to drill down in those little yellow things and find three more pages of schematics behind it. it, it there's just not much there. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's a very simple, straightforward thing. And because it's not PSK specific in the hardware, you can adopt this thing or adapt it to RTTY, PSK63, all sorts of other digital modes, as long as there's enough horsepower in the DS pick to handle it. Uh, when I looked at the schematic, and then after I listened to my signal and you saw the spectrum over there, I thought, hmm, maybe it'd be nice to have isolated audio. Uh, there's no transformer in this. Um, there's, uh, there's always room for improvement in things. And, uh, but I especially like the, uh, the switching regulator background noise generator. It made it really a lot of fun. Um, uh, ser seriously, it, it's, it, it's, it's a very, very interesting project, and these guys are to be commended for, for having pulled it off. Here's a picture of the prototype system. Uh, this is uh, the, the reason I used my FT817 was because I thought if they're using it in their prototype, I should use it in my demo. Um, and now I see the reason why mine's not working. Let's, mine doesn't work so well, and let's see if you can pick up on it when I run the video, or when Doug runs a video camera over here to show running this thing. 
Uh, there's a prototype of the digital PSK modem there. The early one had a separate character display for text and graphics display for the, uh, the spectrum monitor for tuning. Uh, that's all been consolidated into one display and then a little mini keyboard. I'm going to go ahead and run a demo of this. Now we've got to try and figure out the next trick. Let's see if I can remember this. Lights, volume. Ah, there it is, I think. Oh, there it is. Okay. Look, you want to focus in on the 817 for a moment. Can you see what the difference is on that 817 from what I showed you before? Hmm? Okay. The other 817 had the blue backlight turned on. Mine has the amber backlight turned on. Okay. Okay. Just wanted to see how close of attention you're paying here. Okay. So here's, the, uh, here's this NUE PSK modem. This happens to have a, a backlight feature that's turned on. So this is, for, this is the direct sunlight northwest mode. This is the direct sunlight Arizona mode. And that also enables you to adjust your battery power drain. This says that the battery might last long enough for the QSO, and this says it'll die just when you're getting to the important information. That's right. That's right. Very good. Okay. So let's, uh, let's see if we can initiate something here. So you can see as, as it's transmitting that the... The text that's being transmitted is scrolling across the bottom of this thing. And now it's done. Let's see if, uh, if this station is still working. And I probably need to retune, which means I need to unlock something here. And let's see if I can... Uh, Okay, so you can see that it, it acquired the signal, it took it a moment to do so, and now it's playing back a, a brag tape where this, this computer is pre-programmed to lie. So it's, uh, it's talking about how the home station might be set up. Uh, and and this, is, this is unfortunately what you see a lot of in PSK31 operation is F1, CQ, type in the guy's call, F2 to reply, F3, my station consists of, F4, Thank you for the QSO signing off, and then you get a date timestamp as it goes to his automatic logger, and then you hit F1 again. So it still requires operator intervention to get that sequence of F1 through F4 correct, but 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 it's not a requirement to to send information that way. Yes, everything else is a rag juice. So so we'll end that. Okay. So uh, if you want to just zoom back a little bit. Yes, the, the, this, you know, so you can really build a, a pretty compact uh, system here. This is a very small keyboard, as you can see. It, it's designed for hands a lot smaller than mine, but I can still find F1 and F2, okay. Um, the modem itself and a, and a small QRP transceiver, a little bit of cabling between them. If the batteries actually accepted a charge in my 817, I wouldn't have to have the AC adapter on it nor would I need the AC adapter on the modem. So this, this really is a small, compact way to uh, approach PSK31 and eventually other digital mode operation without, uh, without requiring a PC. And this is really just a test to see how, how still Doug can hold that camera, and he's probably getting tired of that. So we'll get back to this. Thanks. And we'll, we'll need Doug's AV skills here in, a, in another moment along with somebody else's uh, uh, code slapper skills. Ah, ah, yeah, that's right. Doug, Doug has a problem sending code with his left foot at the same time that he's holding a video camera still. Now, we could put the video camera on your left foot. We won't go there either. Okay, um, this happens to be a picture of a complete uh, PSK31 station that you see here. Uh, it consists of, of everything that you need. You just have to add an operator and and of course an antenna and a power supply, but you need that no matter what you're doing. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the Elecraft K3, and I need to put out the standard disclaimer. Um, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a part-time employee of Elecraft. Uh, I definitely have an interest in the K3. I've been working on the K3 since the summer of 2003. Um, 
And uh, most people weren't aware of anything even about a K3 until the Visalia conference last year at the end of April. It was one of the best kept secrets that, uh, that we've ever pulled off, I think. Um, and, and the way to do that was quite easy. We just made sure that everybody that was on the team had no desire for political office. And um, shame on me. Okay, let, let, let me advance. We've looked at that picture long enough. So when we were developing the, the, the K3, we thought about, in addition to all the other things that we had in mind for this radio, uh, Wayne, uh, N6KR, Wayne Burdick and I, we wanted to put a fun mode into this thing. Now when I got started in this project in, uh, in, in the summer of 03, I, I bought an ICOM 746 Pro, the one that I've got sitting on the table here, because I wanted to get an idea about what what modern DSP-based radios did and didn't do and could and couldn't do and so forth. And I thought that this was a pretty good representative sample of a, of, of a you know, not, not the high end, but, but a, a, a competitive radio. And one of the things that I initially had a lot of fun with on this radio was the fact that it has a built-in RTTY decoder. And uh, I'd find myself when I was working on stuff that I'd have the radio tuned up and I'd tune around and find a ready signal and just kind of watching it decode across the screen. And I know it sounds stupid, but I'm a nerd. Uh, it, it, it was fun. Uh, but it was kind of spoiled a little bit because it was receive only. And, 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 and I, I am a ham, not an SWL. And it would be fun to transmit. But if I wanted to transmit, well, then I got the sound card interface and turn on the computer and run the cables. And the, in my shack, the radios are at one side of the room and the computer's at the other side of the room. It's kind of like on this table here. It's, it's just kind of awkward. The other thing that, that I, I stumbled across, this amazing fact that I'm sure is news to all of you, is that there's a lot more PSK activity than RTTY activity. It just so happened that when I got my, my 746 Pro and turned it on, that it was one of the two weekends a year when there's ready signals. And it was at a time when there wasn't an ARRL bulletin. Uh, otherwise, if I want to see ready activity, it, 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 it happens every now and then, but it's just not a lot. So we thought, OK, well, we don't want to just put RIDI in this thing. We want to put PSK in this thing. Now, of course, again, ICOM beat us to the punch. And for $10,500, you can buy a radio that has PSK31 decoder in it. But, but that was beyond our budget. And it didn't exist at that time, at least that we were aware of. So we wanted to put PSK in this thing. We wanted to put RTTY in this thing. Uh, since Wayne was involved in it, we agreed we put CW in this thing. But we also wanted it to be able to transmit. Uh, and it, it, in the end, we had to make a kind of a minimalist approach to this so that we could make something that was practical and fun and doable, but not complex and not something that would suck up all of the DSP resources in the radio. Because unlike this little PSK modem that we just demonstrated, the DSP inside of this radio has to make it be a radio. And, and the other reason that we wanted it to be a, a straightforward approach to the algorithm is because I'm the guy that's on the hook to write all the DSP code for the radio. And I'm always trying to make my So an important point, anybody that's involved in software stuff, and again, given the venue, I'm sure that a lot of people here are at least peripherally involved with software stuff, is that good performance doesn't necessarily require complex algorithms or structures. When G3PLX first uh, developed his PSK31 mode, he did not have waterfall displays. He did not have a sound card. He was not decoding eight different text streams at the same time. He was doing something fairly simple and straightforward, yet worked well enough that it got people hooked. And this uh, particular illustration is from, uh, from some of his early work on this. And, and you can see that this is both the modulator and the demodulator. And this block diagram is simpler than just the modulator was in the other one. Um, if, you're, if you're careful and a little bit clever about how you approach what you're doing, you can do a lot with only a little. And that's kind of the QRP mantra anyway. So we just, we just thought small when we did this and, uh, and, and made it work. Now, we had some limitations. You remember that photograph that I showed you uh, in, in about the, the K3? It has a couple of displays. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll get the camera on this in a moment. But there's a lower display in it that's an alphanumeric display, but it's only seven characters long. Well, now the question becomes, if you've only got a seven character scrolling display, can you really have a QSO? Can you really follow what's going on? Um, and so we ran some experiments. 
and discovered that with seven characters, you really could follow what was going on. It was really surprising. At six characters, you generally could follow what was going on as well. Context pretty well. When you got down to five characters or less, it was pretty hard. Um, so we were happy that we had seven characters. Uh, but then the other question that comes up is, what about a keyboard? I mean, it'd be great to have a keyboard jack on the radio, and in fact, the radio has a keyboard jack. But uh, we didn't want to write the code to support a keyboard yet. So, and that's one more thing to drag around. But being that the company was Elecraft, and being that a lot of the background of the company is people that, that pound brass, we thought there's got to be a, a better way than a keyboard. Well, it turned out we didn't need no uh, since Since we're hams, um, uh, CW is, is, is part of our heritage, part of our legacy. Okay. So we use the universal input device, a CW paddle. Now, we weren't the first people to do this. George Heron, uh, uh, one of the guys involved in the NUE PSK31 modem, had built a box in 2000 that had a dedicated DSP board and a, and a PSK, was it an 80, a warbler that he had in there, and a PSK20. He had, he had a couple of transceivers and stuff in a box, and he had a CW interface to it so that he could send, and he also made it output in CW. But I wasn't about to go there. So we wound up using the, uh, using the paddle for an input. So on a practical basis, are you going to win the worldwide RIDI contest operating a paddle on a K3 or, or a PSK contest or something? The answer is no. No, cer certainly not. But it is, it is suitable for casual operation. You're out in, the, out in the woods out there, and you feel like you want to have a CUSO with somebody, and there's a lot of activity going on around 14070. You can jump in if you want. So it's good for use in the field. Uh, it happens that at the moment it does CW ready in PSK31, encode and decode. Um, and PSK63 and other stuff will happen. But, but the focus of it was fun. The focus of it wasn't to replace everything and logbook of the world and all the rest of it. And, and, and we felt that we were pretty successful when after the K3 started to ship that we got several reports from people that said that, you know, they've never operated digital loads before. But there was a contest going on. There was something going on. And they just tuned around. And this thing started decoding it. And they had their paddle plugged into it. And they, they were able to have QSOs with it. And they were just having fun. And, and really, in the end, that's, that's what it's really all about. OK, we're going to attempt to demonstrate this now. If I can get my able assistance up here. Okay, okay. Let's see if, I just want to get the resolution up so people get a hint that it might be working, but they can't really tell that it's not. Um, okay, so what we have here is the, is the front panel of the, of the K3. On the top is our presumed transmitting frequency, and on the bottom it's just decoding noise, because one of the nice things about PSK31 is you can carry on interesting QSOs when there's nobody at the other end. <laughs> there you go. OK, so uh, what I think we'd like to try is, is uh, if Wayne can send a, uh, let's see, is this, uh, yeah, this will probably work. Um, go, go ahead and uh, Wayne, Wayne is going to be sending some CW here, probably send a CQ or something. So you can hear the side tone there. For the operator, he gets the CW side tone feedback, so he knows what he's doing. And you can sort of hear the PSK31 stuff going on there as well. And you can adjust the relative volumes of those if it, if it gets too distracting. So let's see if I can. Uh, I need you to try that again, please. because I don't have macro keys in here. Let's see if I can make this actually do something. Are you decoding that, perchance? Not really. OK, then what I need to do is 
send something here, and we'll use the auto-tune function over there because I didn't zero beat so good over here. Okay. So you can see that the radio, I pushed a button to tell the radio, please tune that in. So it did. And then it... Uh, See if I can send something back to him. I can't even type accurately, so. That's right, you caught it. Okay, so the bottom line here is we're able to have a cue. So he's using Morse code paddles. I'm using a home station here. And, uh, and he was able to tune me in. And he didn't have to know, well, what should this sound like? He just hit the auto-tune button on the radio, and the radio just slewed right in on top of it. And, and we're transceiving, and we're good. And I'll save the dummy load. There we go. Um, so let me, well, well, we'll have a moment here for questions and answers very shortly. Let me bail out of that. Let me attempt to bail out of that. While I'm answering the questions, we're going to be packing this stuff up, and I'm going to have to exit stage right. Um, anyway, so the point here is that you can do PSK, and you can do other digital modes. It doesn't require a PC. Now, one thing I didn't ask Wayne, Wayne's a pretty good CW op, and he can certainly copy CW a lot faster than PSK31 can send data. But unlike CW, PSK31 is not a mode that you can listen to. It's a mode that you have to have some sort of a decoder. Uh, I, I have not I've heard of people that claim that they could copy RIDI in their head, but I'm not sure that I believed it. Um, but I think they'd have a challenge with PSK31. Anyway, uh, two ways to do it without a PC or to use dedicated purpose of hardware like this PSK modem and, and, and other things similar to it. Or you can uh, get a radio that has a built-in digital modem. Uh, the Elecraft K3, of course, I think is the premier example of this, but, uh, but there are there are or maybe other radios that can do this sort of thing as well. Here's some references for you for PSK31 in general. On the NUE PSK modem, it's pretty simple. It's nue-psk.com. And of course, the, the K3 is from Elecraft. You just go there, and it's the big splashy thing on the, on the page as you go in. So I want to thank you all very much for your attention on this. And uh, anyone have any questions? Sir. Yes. Uh, there, there's a lot of variants of this PSK stuff. PSK 63 is basically PSK 631, but done twice as fast. So it occupies twice the bandwidth. The data goes through twice as fast. But because, because of Shannon's law, you've got to have a little more power to run it. Your, your margin goes down about 3 dB. Uh, and. And it, it turns out, because it is just another way of doing PSK31, that once you've got PSK31 going, PSK63 is really easy to do. Um, but yeah, there's that. There's also PSK10, really slow PSK. Now, that might be suitable for me using a path. Well, our encoder doesn't accept straight key in input yet. It, 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 it requires a paddle. Okay, we've got some questions over here. Sir, in the front. Yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. Okay, the question was, could you use that little box with something like a K2? And I'm really glad you said K2. Um, yes, and the answer is yes. If you've got the sideband adapter in the K2, then you can use this PSK modem. It's not specific to the uh, to the FT817 at all. All it requires is a sideband transceiver, and and it weighs. I think it weighs 12 ounces, and that little keyboard that I've got there doesn't weigh much either. So it, it wouldn't add a whole lot to your pack to go up on a hill. Sir. Okay. Can I explain the difference between QPSK and BPSK? BPSK is what we typically call PSK31. 
And that's where you shift the phase of the signal 180 degrees. And that's, that's how you encode. So if you do the flip, it's a zero. If you don't do the flip, it's a one, OK? QPSK is quadrature. That means you're shifting the signal 90 degrees, OK? So just as the explanation earlier today was about bits and baud's, one symbol, you're still sending symbols at 31 symbols per second or 31 baud. But each symbol, because it can have four different states, can encode two bits, because 2 squared is 4. So this can be 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1, for example, to encode those bits. So that's basically what's happening with, with the QPSK versus the BPSK. Now, the reason that QPSK31 was developed was, was because the guys that were developing it weren't really sure how well PSK was going to perform. They wanted some way to put error correction in the thing. So by making this quadrature thing, they could encode redundant information. And they, they went to a lot of work to make this, this redundant information thing go. It just turned out that on an HF channel, if, it, if the HF channel would not support BPSK, it really wouldn't support the QPSK with error correction either. It was just not the right kind of noise, not the right kind of run length on the encoding and all. It, it, it gets all complicated. But the bottom line is nobody uses it. People are using BPSK because it works as well as the other, and it's a lot simpler. A long answer to a short question. Bruce. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. For those of you that didn't hear, a, a, a metric that a lot of PSK31 operators use is they'll tell you what your IMD is that they're reporting at their end to give you an idea of the quality of your signal. And when you're typically running PSK31 in a traditional way, you're carefully adjusting all the audio levels and all of that sort of thing so that you're keeping that splatter to a minimum. Okay. And as I mentioned earlier with that one slide, about minus 31 or minus 32 dB in the adjacent channel is about as good as you can get. So you're typically looking to get minus 25 or better, something like that. So the question is, if you're using CW paddles for this thing, how do you adjust that? And so that becomes specific to the K3. And in the K3, we cheated. Uh, we took a shortcut. And that is we're not, even though you, there was audio side tone you were hearing, we're not running that through a sideband transmitter. What we're doing is generating a carrier at the DSP's IF at 15 kilohertz and applying the modulation directly there. So we have complete control over it. So. Uh, what, what you can do is over, you can really, you know, crank the thing up and have the ALC kick in and, and distort the signal if you like, but you got to work at it. Basically, it, it's kind of like um, uh, there was a TV program in the 60s, I'm sure nobody can remember back that far, where they talked about, you know, the outer limits, we are in control of the horizontal and vertical. Well, it's the same kind of thing. We're in control of the, of the IMD here so that we can give you reasonable IMD figures without you having to mess with it, especially in a portable operation. So if a person comes back and complains about your IMD, there's really nothing you can do about it. But uh, on the other hand, we've made it hard for you to, to make it any worse than we intended it to be. Now, now and of course, another way you can do it is to have too low of a voltage for your transmitter. That, that really helps bring down IMD because you wind up clipping in the transmitter. Sir? Okay, so the question, what th th this guy wants to hack into his iPhone, only, only in this case, it happens to be the K3. He wants to know if there's a, an SDK or so, some way to get inside the DSP software inside of the thing. And the answer to that is no. I, I'm the gatekeeper on that, and, and I would get a lot more than a hand slap if I gave people hooks into, into getting into it. But, but we try to be responsive to suggestions, and, uh, and, and I'd love to hear suggestions about other modes that might be practical to implement this way. You know, MT63 and some of these other things could, could be a lot of fun. But there won't, we would not be doing video sorts of modes. You know, Hellscriber and stuff like that wouldn't be in there, nor would fax or slow scan TV, that sort of thing. OK, one more. Yeah? Mm-hmm. The, uh, the, the JT65 is what he mentioned for QRP, which is Joe Taylor's low 
uh, weak signal work for HF, similar to how you do moon bounce. The way that works is you have 65 tones. So each one represents a letter, a number, whatever. So all you got to do is get four bits across, four baud, and, and, and you've got the symbols across and you're done with the QSO. Other questions? These people have been dominating over here. Surely we've got, we got to balance things with questions over here. Yes, well, I'm glad because I thought maybe they had all the caffeine. Yeah. That, that's right. PSK31 is designed to, to keep up kind of with typing speeds, which is about what a good CW operator can do or what a teletype guy would do. It's, it's 31 uh, baud. And, and, and in this case, it's also 31 bits per second. But that very code alphabet means that it's doing, I, I don't remember off the top of my head if it's you know, the equivalent of 40 words a minute or 50 or 60 or something like that. But as I say, there's also PSK63 for the people that really want to type fast or have had the Mountain Dew, then they can go to PSK63. There's also you know, twice as fast as that, PSK125. That's also available in some of these programs. And that's also just another incremental step in the, in the, in the algorithm to be able to keep up with that. Sir. Mm hmm Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah. Right. Mm hmm Mm hmm Okay, the, 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 the question is basically that if you're doing CW or even RIDI, there's no real lockup time associated with things. With PSK, you've got to lock onto the signal, track the phase, track the frequency. There's a certain amount of processing that happens which results in latency. So when you start to receive the signal, it might be some tens or maybe even 100 or 200 milliseconds before you start to get data out of it, which slows contest operators down if you're trying to switch back and forth really fast. So again, PSK is more of a keyboard QSO mode. I would say, than it is a contest fast exchange mode. That's just my own personal opinion. I think we may have time for, for one more question. Not time for the answer, but time for the question. Sir. Right, so the question is, Bluetooth is, is a personal area network method of getting rid of wires, short cables, and can that be used uh, for this kind of interfacing of keyboards, headsets, that sort of thing? And the answer is yes. There's an outfit in Britain uh, that it advertises in the RSGB bulletin where they, uh, where they sell Bluetooth adapters to plug into your radio to replace, to, so you can use a Bluetooth headset. Somebody's holding up something over there. Okay. Uh huh. Perfect. Perfect. So yeah. Okay. So in terms of the K. Okay. Well now. Okay. I got to put my Elecraft hat on. Uh, I can say that at this instant there is no work that's going on to put a Bluetooth end into the K3. But if you take the lid off and look inside, you'll see that the KIO three three board stack. It's it, it's a three board stack, and the boards all plugged together. And one of the things that we have in mind is to replace one of those plug-in boards with a different plug-in board that could theoretically uh, do Bluetooth or, or do other things. Because there have been people that are asking about, well, what about USB or, well, what about Ethernet or, you know, all, all sorts of things. There are huge issues associated with that. As the fellow remarked this morning, if you take the ferrites off of your USB cable, then you have a 20-meter transmitter. Um, and if it happens to not be that you want to work 20 meters, or maybe the real problem is if you do want to work 20 meters, um, so th there are a lot of issues involved when you're putting some of this higher speed stuff in there. But, uh, but we put the hooks in there to enable replacement and expansion. That's kind of been the way that we've done things in the past. It's, it, it's how the company thinks. I appreciate the question. And I think I'm out of time. and don't want to take the next guy's time. So Kenny, thank you very much. Thank you very much.
we could just take a vote to see if we just shut the doors and keep asking them questions. Okay, I have a couple of uh, announcements and then we're gonna take maybe a five minute break and uh, come back and get the next talk. Um, yeah, the mic's on. So there are two ham fests, or actually ham fests and the conferences coming up that, that I was asked to announce. Uh, the first one's the Alaska Ham Fest. Starts the 1st of August through the 4th. Um, and where is it at? Uh, Anchorage. So there are flyers on the back tables if you're interested in that. The other one is a little bit more uh, local. The Pacific Northwest VHF Conference is coming up uh, October 3rd through the 5th. And it's in Moses Lake. So just on the other side of the, the mountain, a very nice place. So uh, there are flyers for both of these in the back if you're interested at all. So uh, let's come back in uh, five minutes. <laughs>